I'm Emily Auerbach and welcome to today's lecture, which is part of Eloquence and Eminence Emeritus Faculty Lectures. It's a series I started 24 years ago as a way of showcasing retired UW faculty known for their scholarly expertise and their teaching excellence. This series is sponsored by the Division of Continuing Studies, the Institute on Aging, the Anonymous Committee, Wisconsin Public Television, and WMUU 102.9 uh, Radio. Stuart McCauley is the Malcolm Pittman Sharp Hildale and Theodore Brizzo Professor Emeritus of Law from the UW-Madison. And what all those names mean is a very honored and distinguished professor. Professor McCauley received his law degree from Stanford in 1955 and joined the UW-Madison faculty two years later. A law school event at Stanford noticed, noted that he pioneered the study of business practices and the work of lawyers related to the questions of contract law. And Yale's Grant Gilmore called him the Lord High Executioner of the Contract is Dead movement. <laughs> Professor McCauley has published numerous papers and books, including Images of Law in Everyday Life, The Lessons of School, Entertainment, and Spectator Sports, and Contracts, Law in Action. He has won many honors, including a 2004 Outstanding Scholar Award from the Fellows of the American Bar Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Professor Stuart McCauley for a talk today entitled The Rule of Law and the Law in Action. I invite you to join me uh, in thinking about the American legal system. But given where I come from, uh, I want to think about the law in action part of the American legal system. If you just want to uh, take a look at the rule of law and a lot of writing, it looks like a high school book about the American legal system. You know, the, we have a... Uh, separation of powers, we have federalism, we have a right uh, of jury trial, etc., etc., etc. Well, yeah, that's good, and uh, I, I don't want to uh, say anything negative about that, it's just that there's a lot more going on, and uh, it's that more that's going on to make, uh, that, that we want to turn to and look at it. Um, I'm not trashing the system, let me, uh, push hard on that. I was married to a uh, lawyer who did some wonderful work for uh, about 17 years, sadly died of breast cancer, and um, you know, good people are involved trying to make life better. The problem for a lawyer tends to be, as she found out, by the time you get the problem, your choices are really making something that's terrible really bad. Um, those are the options. Unfortunately, the dean of the law school does not give you a magic wand. This is one of the sad failures in our whole legal education. It would be nice to paste the pages back on the calendar before you met the bad guy, and uh, we haven't got much of a way of doing that. Um, Rule of law has gone from uh, a concern of a few scholars and a couple of international organizations that tried to use it to push uh, third world countries into shaping up their legal system into one of those phrases that you really don't want to uh, search online because you'll just get an overload of hits. Uh, it's just everywhere in the last, uh, oh, what, six months or so. Uh, you know, Donald Trump does not abide by the rule of law. No, it was Barack Obama who didn't deal with the rule of law. I'm hoping to avoid most of that because that really boils back down to who do you like and uh, well, that, that's a fun conversation too, but that's for another time uh, when we, we get into this sort of thing. There are certain parts of it though that I will, uh, things that are going on that I will take a look at. Now, first thing we got to do is take a, a, a look at this idea of the rule of law. And just to avoid having to say the situation, uh, this is something I've never studied or spent much time on. Fortunately, I've got a lot of good friends at the University of Wisconsin Law Faculty who've written fine articles about it, and uh, you know, it's not bad to know who to steal from. That's one of the uh, important things to learn in scholarship, I think. Uh, Catherine Henley, uh, 
says the phrase has become a trendy political slogan around the world, and its content is what you like. And you can pour things in and take them out depending on what you want. And all right, she also makes the point that no country fully realizes 100% the ideals of the rule of law. And that things change. And countries go up and down. John Onesor uh, surveyed the literature, and he notes that a lot of people who aren't lawyers um, have a sort of yes-no. Does this country uh, have the rule of law? Click, check yes, check no. And that's not how it is. What happens is uh, it's an aspiration. It's a goal. It's something that we push towards, and we can always be better. Bill Whitford uh, is an interesting one to look at this way. He has a wonderful article about the rule of law, and I'm going to draw on it a little bit. But he shows you there's a rule of law. He is now the lead plaintiff in a case before the Supreme Court of the United States on gerrymandering in the state of Wisconsin. So uh, I guess if you can go from Madison, Wisconsin onward to the Seventh Circuit, then onward to the uh, Supreme Court of the United States, you're playing with the rule of law. And uh, that's nice. Um, he makes the point that where the hard part comes is you say, well, the king is not above the law, but is within the law or under the law or subject to the law. This is where the, the idea goes back to when uh, the nobles were fighting for the king with power over uh, taxation. Could you run off and fight wars and things like that? It's quite an old idea. One of the great problems is saying, well, the king, the president, the chancellor, whatever you call the head of state, uh, is under the rule of law, is emergencies. Uh, there we want them to have discretion. There is an ad that's on television, and uh, uh, it, it's one of those things that you can get in so many ways these days. Uh, a woman wanting to be a United States senator from Florida, and she points out that on 9-11, uh, 2001, when the uh, airplanes were taken off and crashed into the uh, tw uh, Twin Towers and uh, into the Pentagon, there was still another airplane up there that uh, was heading towards Washington, D.C., and nobody knew um, just exactly w what it was going to do. But, uh, you know, hijackers had taken the plane over. She was a fighter pilot at that point. She was parked at the end of a runway with an armed airplane waiting to go and uh, shoot down a United Airlines jet with about 120 people on it. Uh, well, you know, the, the question, of course, it was George Bush who had to decide whether she went and did, did that. Now, that's what discretion in an emergency uh, comes up with. I think you would be hard-pressed to write a law giving the president power to deal with things like that that would be much more than what I always call the Spike Lee principle of jurisprudence. Do the right thing, baby. I mean, <laughs> that's about all you could say, isn't it? Uh, so many variables. And again, there's no good decision. Which of the terrible decisions, you know, consequences you want? Fortunately, the president didn't have to decide it. Uh, she didn't have to go up and do it. Uh, passengers tried to take the plane over and it crashed in Pennsylvania. Fortunately, I say, I don't really mean that. Uh, again, it was a no-win kind of situation. Well, that's one of the problems when we start saying, well, if, if they have any discretion, uh, it's bad. No, we, we, we've got discretion is one of those things that pops up. Well, all right, there also must be meaningful access to justice. Uh, People ought to be able to say, wait a minute, no, or wait a minute, do something. And it has to be meaningful if you're testing a rule of law. Um, there must be an agency that has enough independence of the other agencies of government that it can say no. This is the idea of a rule of law. Now, some other might add a few things to the Whitford uh, version, which I've just been talking about. For example, one might be, uh, that's in a lot of writing, um, asking whether it's all, everything is for sale. That is, uh, do legal officials actually carry out what they're supposed to do, or is it the highest bidder? 
Right? Are we taking bribes? Is that the kind of situation that we have? Um, and if you want the rule of law, no, we're not taking bribes uh, and this sort of thing. Uh, we would, could also ask if these decisions, these court-like agencies, whatever we call them, uh, come out, if they make the decision, and then what happens? Is it an empty piece of paper that everybody can ignore? Or is there a way of making it matter? This is what we do. Now, this isn't my world, rule of law, those kinds of things. I talked with business people, I talked with lawyers, and I, I had to teach a contracts course. And it kept striking me um, that it ought to be about modern problems. And it ought to be, have something to do with what my students would likely fuss with when they got out of law school. This turned out to be something that offended people. I was the Lord High Executioner of the Contract is Dead movement, and uh, my wife never forgave Grant Gilmore. Uh, she thought that was an outrageous thing to say. Well, all right. Um, I fell into this business of teaching law and society stuff, and uh, as you tend to, you always want to have your own teaching materials, and uh, Lawrence Friedman, a great legal historian, uh, and I uh, put together teaching materials in law and society, and as a result of all of this, I was asked to give a lecture uh, in the mid-1980s at SUNY Buffalo, and uh, as part of it, I tried to come up with, well, what has all this law and society research taught us? Can we generalize? Can we pull it together? Because there was a study of this little thing and a study of this little thing, and you know, it, it all should add up to something. Well, I came up with seven propositions, and uh, I'll drag three of them out here because we have, can't go on and on. People do, but I don't. Uh, I try, I tr I'll try. Um, three of them. One, and they're obvious. That I like propositions summing up scholarship that turns out to be obvious and common sense. The, the ploy, of course, is to make it be exciting because the world really is shaped like a par parallelogram. I mean, then you've really found something. Um, OK, law is not free. Boy, there's a surprise. Two. People are not puppets on the end of a string. They cope with law. Three, law is one of many normative and sanction systems, and it's not neatly harmonized with all the others. Or as one anthropologist who I like put it, law and society, like most of life, is very messy. OK, law is not free. Resources are limited. Somebody has to make some choices. A simple example brings it home. Think of the Internal Revenue Service. Um, I suppose potentially almost every one of us uh, should be audited. I mean, if you, you know, every American citizen who has income, I mean, that, you have to have income, you have to pay taxes, I guess, but every American citizen who has income should be audited. Well, no, that's not going to work. Uh, you, all of our taxes would go to pay auditors. I mean, it just isn't a workable kind of thing. You have to have a strategy. Where are you, go are you going to act? Who are you going to look at? And that opens the door, of course, um, for discretion. And it also opens the door for uh, people to influence the choice where some folks get audited and other folks don't. I mean, that's the problem when you, when you start saying, we'll apply the law some places and not others. Who, who says? How do, how do we decide? There's the discretion problem. There's a study of the Detroit police, and I'm sure it's ancient history now. Uh, what do we do with prostitution? Uh, you know, it's, it's tough streetwalkers, this kind of a thing. Well, essentially what we do is not in the wrong place became the uh, idea. If Streetwalker should not be out in front of the luxury hotels, the fancy restaurants, places like that, if she was out there and plying her trade there, um, the police would pick her up on what was then called a disorderly person's investigation. They'd keep her overnight, she'd lose a nice wages, and they'd say, don't go back there. And you know, it worked the uh, certain areas. But notice what that says. It's okay every place else. 
Well, there's a choice that's being made. Where are the police in Madison? Well, do they drive past your house uh, every hour, every half hour, once a year? Uh, what is the, the situation? And we have an isthmus, of course, between all the lakes, so a police car up in the north uh, east side is not going to help you very much in the far west side. Uh, there is a, a whole business of having to come up with a strategy as where you are and so on. But there's your discretion comes roaring in on that. Okay, not so exciting perhaps. Yes, there's discretion. It has to be exercised. If it's too far out of whack, the political process will intervene. All right. Then we turn to the more modern problem. Individual police officers have discretion in their dealings with members of the public. They can handcuff, hold people while they investigate, and even shoot members of the public under certain circumstances. True, uh, and that's some discretion that bothers people today. Uh, me too. Frank Remington, distinguished Wisconsin law professor, used to say, if you wanted to understand the criminal law, you should read the statutes and those kinds of things, but you should also ride in a squad car on a hot summer night in a big city. That was a lesson. And indeed, he arranged ride-alongs for some law students. Uh, scariest thing in the world they were ever put, up, put to. Uh, much nicer to read law books. They're, you know, bite. Uh, well, all right. Police need discretion to cope with emergency situations where they, other members of the public, or both are at risk. There are standards and statutes, departmental regulations. Police typically receive training in what they can and can't do. And sometimes they're killed, sometimes they're wounded, uh, seriously injured when they're confronting people who are often armed, dangerous, and high on drugs. We have to do this. And we have to recognize that most police, most of the time, behave in a professional manner and are not infrequently heroic. All right, I've said all that. The however is obvious. Increasingly, we've seen videos of just very questionable behavior. And some videos, there's no question, outrageous behavior. The story begins with Rodney King in 1991. He was a black taxi driver who didn't stop when Los Angeles police tried to pull him over. Four white police officers managed to stop him and they beat the daylights out of him after they had him re restrained. A person who lived nearby was out on his balcony with a motion picture camera and filmed the whole thing and gave it to station KTLA TV. And it then, as we say now, went viral. Uh, all around the world, this was shown. To make it even better, many Los Angeles police got on their police radios and did their own commentary on the film with every bit of racist language you could ask for. Okay, here we got, we've got this kind of an event. Uh, the officers were tried in a state case, acquitted by the jury. There was a federal case brought, two of them uh, got a conviction. Uh, people were not all that satisfied with it. Uh, King won a large damages award. He became famous because of his comment that asked, why couldn't we all get along? You may remember that one. Well, many people today carry the kind of phone where you can film uh, motion pictures and so on. And guess what they film? White police beating or shooting blacks. There are a lot of those films, and they come roaring out at us. Um, one of the problems uh, that we have uh, looking at all of this is, uh, are the films misleading? They cut in sort of at the middle of the show or the middle of the action, obviously. You have to see something happening so that you'll film it. Well, that means you've missed the opening move. There's the problem with the films. Now, sometimes there's no problem. I don't mean to say everything. Um, 
At first, no prosecutions, then prosecutions, juries won't convict. Uh, we've had a case with a judge without a, a jury. He said burden of proof wasn't carried. You remember, he's got this criminal burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. All right, um, there's a great debate. Black Lives Matter. Several black professional football players have made themselves famous. I suppose I don't have to go through all the details of Colin Kaepernick and Eric Wright and all of this. Uh, do we kneel for the national anthem or not? And then we lost all the white police, black victims, and now we're worrying about dishonoring servicemen or some such thing, or service persons and so on. Police organizations are demanding that uh, uh, police get support. The United States Deputy Sheriff's Association sent out a fundraising letter, urgent, with the radical anti-cop movement sweeping the country, horrible ambush cop killings rising at staggering rates, the constant threat of ISIS-inspired terror. Your state and local law enforcement officials are literally under attack. They need your help. Well, this doesn't sound to me like something that's going to get solved very easily. There was the idea, oh, we could solve this. Let's put body cameras on all the police. Wouldn't it be nice if that just, you know, smile, you're on candid camera. If you're old, you'll remember that phrase. Uh, okay, the police will act differently. Well, we've just had a big study. They don't. Uh, it doesn't seem to uh, deter people, partly because they think they're right in the way they do these things. Law is not free. Law then leads to sending out one or two police to have to try to uh, maintain order, to cope with all kinds of things, all of these kinds of things. And this then leads us to civil rights violations, and it leads us to a crisis of legitimacy. So, what's the solution? 10, 20 years? I'd love to have one that works better. Wouldn't it be nice if a little body camera would just done it? But it won't. It's really something we're going to have to work out, and I don't see it uh, as a quick kind of thing. Um, our criminal law is supposed to offer all accused of a crime a jury trial where guilt is proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, there are trials, there are appeals, but the system is set up to minimize the number of them. O.J. Simpson and Bill Cosby have money and they get trials. Oh boy, do they get trials. Showbiz kinds of things. Most people get a plea bargain. And detectives are trained to interview suspects, uh, seeking confessions, and they're very good at getting them. Uh, people want to tell their story to the sympathetic person. Well, they wind up confessing. But the problem with the thing is, yeah, they say they did these things, but there are the things, and then there's the crime. And maybe they didn't do all the things needed for the crime, but they still confessed to the crime in the plea bargain process. There is the problem with the, with the situation. Um, we've had innocence projects at various schools, and I, we have one I'm very proud to be just associated with, it's a terrific kind of thing. Um, and with DNA, they're able to find various kinds of mistakes. Uh, but the problem is, of course, uh, there are cases where there's no DNA. But the kinds of procedures that they went through were the same procedures that produce this. People are very bad about identifying strangers. You saw them once under great emotion. Can you pick them out now? Well, we're not that good at it. And mistakes come up with this. All right, um, on the civil side. Similar kind of thing. In theory, you can uh, go and have a breach of contract suit, suit all kinds of people. Well, Gross and Siverud say, the function of trials in our system is not dispute resolution. Rather, the real function is to deter other trials. Takes forever, and you have to pay your own lawyer. Uh, and even when you win, there are lots of ways of sidestepping the judgment and doing all of these kinds of things. Uh, moreover, if you have a long-term continued relationship with a person on the other side, um, 
you're probably going to lose it as part of the price of the lawsuit. It's been said we bargain in the shadow of the law, but if you're dealing with a large organization, essentially they have a price they will pay for certain things, and that's about what you can get. There are devices to finance lawsuits. Uh, it ha it's, it's around, but you know, it's hard to claim that we have easy access to justice. Now, it, the widespread notion, and last night on the airplane, uh, I, I was coming back and talking to someone, and the person said, oh, it's terrible that Americans are so litigious. That's just you know, something everybody accepts, except all the data points the other way, and the number of trials is going down so rapidly, we have a whole line of research called the vanishing trial. Well, maybe that's good. It means the world is a happier place because the things that used to send us to court are all gone. Want to bet? Uh, maybe, but I suspect not. And of course, there is this whole business that we get divorces and we have kids and there's support and there's custody. That's not one that's going to go away and that's going to be a very hard one to deal with. Now, we have done better when we've had both class action lawyers, state and federal agencies, and they've been able to cope with certain kinds of things. Well, that's my next thing. People cope with the law. Well, you know, um, let's talk about the, one of the things that that's happens is the, um, people have an attitude that they ought to comply with law. Generally, if you ask them questions, you'll get very high, 78, 80% of people say, even if it's a law you disagree with, you ought to obey it. Well, that's the uh, appropriate answer. Uh, well, is that what they do? Have you driven from here to Milwaukee? Uh, that was one I always liked to try with my class. Uh, if you want to drive from here to Milwaukee on the freeway, and you're going to be absolutely perfectly right there on the speed limit, how many people will pass you? And of course, the class being uh, young 20-year-old law students comes up with the answer you would expect, everyone. I mean, that, isn't that the, the, the notion? The, the, uh, 70 miles an hour means not too much more than that. And how much is too much? That is to be worked out in a case-by-case -case basis with discretion. See, I'm back there again, uh, one of these things. Well, that's traffic laws uh, and those sorts of things. How about taxes? Oh, we pay our taxes. And of course, part of the reason we pay our taxes is for many of us, it's all withheld uh, anyway. And how much leverage have you got? Now, not for everyone, and such. But there are articles about nannies and the income tax law. Now, I, this was something I didn't know about until I started looking into this one, and I find it uh, quite amusing to me, or maybe uh, shocking, I don't know. Uh, you see, you pay the nanny in cash, and she probably is okay to be in the United States, but not okay to work. And you don't deduct anything, and then she doesn't declare it as taxable income, and they all lived happily ever after. And I didn't realize that this, this problem. And then somebody pointed out to me, there was a woman who might have been a Supreme Court justice and whose husband was a Yale law professor and he was running something like this. A Yale law professor? Well, <laughs> that's the story and, and this comes up. Well, all right, as I said, people cope with the law. There are all kinds of drugs that have been outlawed. And of course, we never would buy anything like that. Who, who's kidding? The, we have the whole story of prohibition, uh, which is part of American culture, which we've made into a story of how wonderful it was to be in Chicago, dancing to ragtime music and drinking uh, you know, bootleg scotch. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a story. I have no idea how much truth there is to it, but it is part of our culture. Well, that leads us to the story of marijuana, which is, again, one of the, to me, one of the fascinating kinds of things. It's illegal, except not in Colorado, and California's in the transition, and then there are about, what, 10 states or so that if it's for medical use, it's okay. 
well, I'm a little depressed, so uh, uh, I have a medical problem there. Uh, there. This is one of the problems. Now, notice the shift that's taking place going from this evil weed into what, something that's going to be, you know, will Amazon sell it, or will that be their Whole Foods subsidiary that will sell, <laughs> sell the thing? I mean, it, it's fascinating, and we're learning about the fact that there's a whole industry that exists. It's illegal, but that doesn't say it doesn't exist. And there have been articles in the New York Times about the transition in California, where they start learning about, uh, you know, just marijuana and how it's distrib distributed and where it is. And then we've had the great fires that were in Nap the Napa Valley wine country, which ruined a lot of the wine, but also ruined a lot of the marijuana. And suddenly, this stuff becomes available because, you see, it's in this transition place in California, isn't it illegal? Now, things that were kept hidden are coming forward. A great deal of effort of law enforcement has gone in to try to stamp out marijuana. Hasn't been 100% successful, obviously. Um, again, uh, people cope with law, and we have this. They also, coping, um, we have corporate lawyers who are very good at coping with laws that bother their clients. Uh, one of them, as a contracts teacher, I was fascinated with it, master supply agreements. And this is like Boeing buys wings and wheels and uh, uh, all kinds of good stuff like that from just this large group of suppliers. Boeing writes the great treaty. To call it a contract is kind of stretching things a little because the choice you have is, do you want to make all the money of supplying wings to Boeing? There's your choice. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it our way. That's the master supply agreement. And they've evolved over time into documents that ward off any possible rights of the supplier to hold Boeing in the courts. The problems between Boeing and the suppliers will be handled someplace else, not the courts. That's what a master supply agreement does. Well, but that, you know, if, if you worry about Boeing and uh, John Deere and uh, Harley Davidson and stuff like that, good. Well, I'm, I'm glad you have those contacts and I hope it uh, gives you a nice uh, life and such. But the one that hits most people is the arbitration clause. They're everywhere, you know. They've gone from something 25 years ago, no one had ever seen one of these things, and now um, whatever your uh, uh, phone, you got an arbitration clause on what, what, your phone supplier, your Visa or MasterCard, or you got to arbitrate that one. Um, your employment, sure, got, got arbitration clause there, and just one after another after another, that, that all of us. It is perfectly possible to have arbitration schemes that are better than the courts. Perfectly possible. But is that what we're getting? Part of the problem is no one knows, because the key thing arbitration gives the large companies that use these things is their disputes and problems vanish. Newspaper folks can't get at them. Nobody knows what happens. Now, in the uh, manner of being a law professor, I mean, I don't, I don't want to uh, bother you and fool you into thinking that I'm not a law professor. I'll take one horrible example an N of one, as they sometimes say, and uh, tell you one horrible example and then sort of imply it might be typical and uh, we leave it at there. Isn't that the way uh, non-social sciences, sciences work? Something of that sort. But this one's too good to throw away because it's fun. <laughs> Gateway computers. S delightfully from what they did in this case, I'm happy they've gone away. Uh, couldn't have happened to a nicer bunch of folks. But they were, their whole image, they were in South Dakota and they had cow spots on their boxes and now you're getting a computer from down home folks that you can really trust. There was the, there was their image. Do you remember gateways? Uh, okay. Um, they set up 
an arbitration scheme. They were the ones who got us into all this sort of thing. Uh, you couldn't have discovered the arbitration clause unless you really were a lawyer or somebody seeking it because you didn't get it until you got the owner's manual which came in the box with the computer and you didn't get that until you'd paid your money and you bought the computer. And you, of course, always, when you buy any product, immediately take out the owner's manual and read it cover to cover. Uh huh. And in fact, in the computer world, at least in my family, uh, the more you know about computers, the less likely you are to read a manual because that shows weakness. You see, you, you're supposed to be able to do all this without reading the manual. So if you really wanted to hide something, where's the best place to hide it? On page of million and 72 of the uh, gateway owner's manual. That's where it was. Okay, the clause says that the arbitration would be governed by the rules of an international association based in Paris, France. Uh-huh. But the rules were just incorporated by reference. I mean, the buyer had to find them for herself. Okay, but if you did find the rules, what were they? The consumer was to pay a fee of $4,000 to start the process. How much does a computer cost? Um, if the consumer won, she would get $2,000 back. Whoopee, you're all heart. If the consumer lost, she got nothing back, and she owed Gateway its lawyer's fees. No, I'm, I'm not making this up. <laughs> the arbitration was to be held in Chicago, even if the consumer lived in Seattle, San Diego, Miami, or Portland, Maine. Just, just the getting to Chicago and existing there made it a silly thing. This is dispute resolution? Come on now, this is a joke. Paul Carrington, who was Professor uh, Vanderbilt, and one of my friends, uh, wrote an article on why the lawyer who did this should be disbarred. <laughs> my own view? Right on, Paul. <laughs> but he wasn't disbarred, he became the folk hero. And he went around uh, to various meetings telling people how they could get arbitration clauses. Well, okay. Now, I say, again, it uh, doesn't have to be bad. You could set up perfectly good arbitration clauses, but we don't know if anybody has set them up because the game is to keep it all hidden. We may have wonderful arbitration, we may have horrible arbitration, but since it's all secret, who knows? All right. Law is not the only normative uh, or sanctions uh, system in society, or again, as my students put it, law is not the only picture show in town. Uh, the last one of these. We have all kinds of institutions that take on functions that the law normally takes on when people want to control them or have more of them. Uh, there are trade associations that set up rules for the people in the association because you can't wait for the legislature to uh, come up with the rules. They supply the kind of mediation arbitration that makes a lot of sense, and that's where you want to drag in somebody who really knows the area. In our trade, is this the way to do things? If that's the question, and we're talking about people in a trade, then the arbitration makes perfect sense as a way of, of handling the problem. Much better than a jury of 12 people or six people picked because they're not biased. That means they don't know anything about this. You want the other way around. You want the, the people who really know, and they, you can do this kind of thing. We have private police all over the place, as those of us who follow uh, things like the shooting in Las Vegas learn. Uh, the casinos and hotels have armies. It's the best way to put it. Some of them are armed, some of them are simply there to uh, answer questions, uh, a great big group. One got shot as part of that one as it handles. There is one thing that happens that I start nudging towards the other side because remember, another kind of organization that exists is called organized crime. Yeah, there's, there's a, there's a they, they have norms. Believe me, they have plenty of norms. Uh, they're famous for it. And boy, they have sanctions. So, uh, you know, and they do compete with lawful activity. But in between, you have lawful groups, large corporations, 
And um, we have this new idea of everything that's going to be quantified. And what you're going to do is to make sure your employees are really working, as uh, one of my sons pointed out to me, Dilbert has Wally. Wally is the engineer in Dilbert who's a genius at not doing any work. He's always evading work. The idea of quantification is you're going to tie things really in and see if Wally is showing up and actually producing, lowering costs or getting more profit or you know, increasing sales, whatever Wally's supposed to be doing. Well, all right, this is all very good. Uh, very often top management takes the position, this is something for middle management. Don't bother me with this. That also makes deniability possible. You know, if, we, if you do something that's not so good, well, well, I don't know about it. Sometimes a great innovation is found. It turns out to be wonderful. Sometimes you get the tale of what, to me, and again, judging just from what I read in the newspapers and the kinds of bulletins that come on my email, is a totally corrupt corporation called Wells Fargo. How many wicked things can any corporation do? They're setting the record. And they're, they don't want the record ever to be touched by anybody else, so they're working hard to find more corrupt, terrible things to do. And there they set up. At least it looks that way from a newspaper reader. Essentially, you put the pressure on your employees who deal with customers, and you hold them to certain kinds of standards. They've got to, you know, increase sales this much, lower things this much. There, there are these, these quantitative indicators. And there's only one way for most people to keep their job, cheat, and cheat the customers. Um, but what, I have a Wells Fargo, thank God I don't, but uh, assume I have a Wells Fargo uh, bank account. Well, you just move it over into their premium deluxe with Gold Stars bank account, which uh, has all kinds of little goodies, and the fees double the basic account. Did you ask them? No, you just move it in and send them a bill. A lot of people pay it. Or if they're not paying the bill, you just take the money out of the account. <laughs> Sounds to me like stealing. <laughs> All right, or you have, you, have to, you have insurance on the car where you borrowed the money. You got the insurance. Oh, you have to buy additional insurance from them. And I'm not going, I couldn't possibly go through all of these things. We'd be here till dawn uh, because they've come up, a new one comes up and a new one comes up. Well, all right, uh, just to make it better, there were some honest Wells Fargo employees, as I would have expected. They tried to blow the whistle. What happened to them? just completely fired and their reputations trashed, no letters of recommendation for new jobs and things of this sort. Now, I must say, there's hope that some of the folks who did this will get the, what to do them. I must say, a friend, of, another friend of mine, Elizabeth Warren, who left the uh, academy and teaching contracts and good stuff like that and went out and became professional troublemaker. Is that, uh, no, she's a United States Senator, isn't that what she's, I, I lose my friends when they stop being contracts teachers. It's, you just lose track of what they're doing. Well, one of the things she'd done for many years is cope with first year law students who really didn't do the work and prepare for today's class. Now I must say, if you've never seen one of the what is it, 1L or the paper chase, one of those old movies. Uh, first year law students go through a kind of hazing process uh, where you just, you're unprepared, you're on, you're talking today. If you don't need to prepare, aren't we lucky? And uh, of course the, the, student, the professor uh, makes a fool of you and this is called education by intimidation and humiliation. All the educational psychology people say it's a wonderful way of teaching. <laughs> That's sarcasm, okay? I just, I don't believe that. I always said that uh, what the Stanford Law School did in my day it influenced my teaching completely. Whatever they do, I won't do. Because uh, it was education by humiliation and all this. Well, 
Liz Warren managed to get the president of uh, Wells Fargo, and he became a first-year law student who was unprepared. It was fun to see. <laughs> all right, maybe that's all we get. And of course, he'll have his golden parachute and live happily ever after. That's too cynical. Uh, Takata airbags, same story. Remember, Takata had airbags, and they have this device that triggers them and sends them off, and it turned out that they were exploding and sending shrapnel into the people who were driving the cars. And what had happened was the management of uh, Takata had signed contracts with all the major auto manufacturers who were buying these uh, devices, whereby they would reduce the price every quarter. Well, you know, you can only do that so long and still make the product. I mean, maybe I don't know, understand engineering and quantification well enough, but it does seem to me that, are we gonna make these things out of smoke? I mean, how, at some point, you gotta put a, a, a little investment in the device and make it work. Well, this contract didn't allow for that. I mean, somehow or other, you'll cut the price and do it. Well, all right. Um, maybe getting Wally to work is a good thing, and maybe quantification is that, but built in it is this negative that uh, we have to look at. Uh, and as I say, as part of organizations competing with legal organizations, here it is. And as I say, I don't want to take the time about organized crime. Too many movies on that. We don't need to uh, go back and look at these. Well, what do I conclude? I suppose what I conclude is that uh, uh, it's all very complicated. Uh, it isn't easy one way or the other, that there are lots of threats to having the kind of legal system we want, that uh, all of this exists. Wolf Haderbrand is a sociologist. He's extremely critical. He says, negotiated process rationality, that's his word for what I've just been describing, word, phrase, uh, tolerates diversity indeterminacy, and it doesn't yield transparent, highly predictable law. To the degree that affects the outcome of disputes, we lose constitutional safeguards. We lose both substantive procedural rights. Moreover, some individuals and interests will be able to play the game of informal negotiated process better than others. Rather than imposing some restraint on power, this form of governance often amplifies the benefits of holding power. It's highly attractive to the interests of corporate and transnational governance. Well, yeah, uh, there's a lot of truth in that. I don't want to go too far. We still have people out there doing good, using the tools of what we have of a legal system. And uh, I, I certainly just want to encourage them and do what we can to make things better. There's enough of a rule of law in place that a lawyer can make a phone call, can write a letter, can do sorts of things, and in some cases, work out a solution to a problem. I said in some cases, not all. Um, again, if I may do something very personal. Uh, my late wife died in 2000. She'd practiced law, uh, as I said, 17 years. Tammy Baldwin, our United States Senator, her first job out of law school was working for Jackie in Jackie's office. She wrote a wonderful letter on the United States Congress letterhead that uh, was part of the stuff we handed out at Jackie's memorial. Uh, she had something that would have gotten Jackie crying. Uh, she said, she taught me how to practice law and still have a heart. Uh, you know, there are people who are practicing law Oh, lawyers are terrible folks. Uh, they, they don't do anything. And I know so many people who've made the world a little bit better. I'm not claiming that they can come out and, uh, you know, not Superman, Wonder Woman, uh uh They can make things a little better. And sometimes just having somebody talk for you and advocate your side makes it a little easier to bear a terrible burden. Well, 
I still want to have folks like that. I hope it doesn't all turn into arbitration. I hope it all, the hidden, which is really, I mean, fine, a lawyer can deal with arbitration if you have it open enough to do these things. Um, the system, after all, has managed to stop Volkswagen from polluting. It is the legal system did that, and that's good. I mean, that, that's such, with such a blatant cheating. I mean, and it's the nice thing about it, or the terrible thing about it, is it's high tech. Somebody came up with software that would fool the test for how much pollution is put in the air. Hey, this is pollution being put in the air by a Volkswagen. And it got stopped. I, I'd celebrate that. Uh, that's good. And, and we've got a situation like that. And there are cases much less exciting, much less, newspaper won't cover them, but maybe worked out a little better and so on. Oh, you want examples of lawyers doing things I don't like? How about the gateway guy? Oh, I, I'll throw a brick at him just like everybody else, but not all folks do things like that. One of the things as I ended my teaching career that bothers me a little bit. Um, we need the help of someone to cope with modern organizations. Can we have people trained in law schools who will do this? And one of the problems, as, as you know, we all know, uh, tuition just keeps going up and up. Then you take out the loans and can you have a practice where you deal with ordinary people, or is that too, uh, that doesn't let you pay off your loans fast enough? Can we have public defenders? Can we have assistant district attorneys? Uh, tough jobs where we need good people, but this whole business of education suddenly going out of things. That troubles me. Um, Again, what is the image of our time? Is it United Airlines selling people seats with incredible forms? You know, there's a form contract there and the ticket sale and things like that. And finding that it needs five of its pilots to go someplace. So you, you, and you are getting off the plane. But I'm a doctor, I've got appointments. Argument, Chicago police come in and drag the doctor down the aisle. Can't get there, that can't be where we're going. And I'm just hoping that maybe if we train a few lawyers and a few other troublemakers that uh, people at United Airlines will think, you know, that was not the best idea. Uh, I so old, I remember when commercial would come on, there'd be this picture of a United jet plane flying. George Gershwin would be playing, and they told us that we were going to fly the friendly skies. <laughs> Somehow or other, United Express just didn't get it. But maybe with a few people kicking and screaming a bit, the world will be a little bit better. Thank you.